Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> the President last evening presented the outlines of the agreement and by common agreement between us and the North Vietnamese, we are today releasing, we have today released the text and I'm here to uh, explain, to go over briefly what these texts uh, contain and uh, how we got there, what we have tried to achieve in recent months and where we expect to go from here. Let me begin by going through the agreement which you have read. <coughs> the agreement, as you know, is in uh, nine chapters. The first affirms the independence, sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity as recognized by the 1954 Geneva Agreements on Vietnam, agreements which established uh, two zones divided by a, uh, a military demarcation line. Chapter 2 deals with a ceasefire. The ceasefire will go into effect at 7 o'clock Washington time on Saturday night. Uh, the principal provisions of Chapter 2 deal with uh, permitted acts uh, during the ceasefire and with what the obligations of the various parties are with respect to the ceasefire. Chapter 2 also deals with the withdrawal of American and all other foreign forces from Vietnam within a period of 60 days, and it specifies the forces that have to be withdrawn. These are, in effect, all military personnel and all civilian personnel dealing in with, uh, in with uh, combat operations. We are permitted to retain economic advisors and uh, civilian technicians serving in uh, certain of the uh, of the military uh, branches. Chapter 2 further deals with the <coughs> uh, provisions for resupply and for the introduction of outside forces. There is a flat prohibition against the introduction of any military force into South Vietnam from outside of South Vietnam, which is to say that whatever ever forces may be in South Vietnam, from outside South Vietnam, specifically North Vietnamese forces, cannot receive reinforcements, replacements, or any other form of augmentation by any means whatsoever. With respect to military equipment, both sides are permitted to replace all existing military equipment on a one-to-one -one basis under international supervision and control. <coughs> there will be established, as I will explain when I discuss the protocols, for each side three legitimate points of entry through which all equipment, all replacement equipment has to move uh, these legitimate points of entry will be under international supervision. Chapter 3 deals with the return of captured military personnel and foreign civil civilians, as well as with the question of civilian detainees uh, within South Vietnam. Uh, this, as you know, throughout the negotiations presented enormous difficulties for us. Uh, we insisted throughout that the question of American prisoners of war 
and of American civilians captured with it throughout Indochina should be separated from the issue of Vietnamese civilian personnel detained, partly because of the enormous difficulty of classifying the uh, Vietnamese civilian uh, personnel by categories of who was detained for reasons of the Civil War and who was detained for criminal activities. And secondly, because it was foreseeable that negotiations about the release of uh, civilian detainees would be complex and difficult, and because we did not want to have the issue of American personnel mixed up with the <coughs> issues of civilian personnel in South Vietnam. This turned out to be one of the thorniest issues that was settled at some point and kept reappearing throughout the negotiations. It was one of the difficulties we had during uh, the December negotiations. As you can see from the agreement, the return of American military personnel and captured civilians is separated in terms of uh, obligation and in terms of the time frame from the return of Vietnamese civilian personnel. The return of American personnel and the accounting of missing in action is unconditional and will take place within the same time frame as the, with, as the American withdrawal. The issue of Vietnamese civilian personnel will be negotiated between the two Vietnamese parties over a period of three months. And as the agreement says, they will do their utmost to resolve this question within a three months period. So I repeat, the issue is separated uh, both in terms of obligation and in terms of the relevant time frame from the return of American prisoners, which is unconditional. We expect that American prisoners will be released uh, in, uh, at intervals of <coughs> two weeks or 15 days in roughly equal installments. We have been told that no American prisoners are held in Cambodia. American prisoners held in Laos and North Vietnam will be returned to us in Hanoi. They will be received by American medical evacuation teams and, um, and flown on American airplanes from Hanoi to places of our own choice uh, probably uh, Vientiane. <coughs> uh, there will be international supervision of both this provision and of the uh, provision uh, for, uh, for the missing in, uh, in action. <coughs> uh, and all American prisoners uh, will, of course, be released within 60 days of the signing of the agreement. The signing will take place on uh, January 27th in two installments, the significance of which I will explain to you uh, when I have got run through the provisions of the agreement and the associated uh, protocols. <coughs> Chapter 4 of the agreement deals with the right of the South Vietnamese people to self-determination. <coughs> its first provision <coughs> contains a joint statement by the United States and North Vietnam in which those two countries jointly recognize the South Vietnamese people's right to self-determination, in which those two countries jointly affirm that the South Vietnamese people shall decide for themselves the political system that they uh, shall choose.
and jointly affirm that no foreign country shall impose any political tendency on the South Vietnamese people. <coughs> the other principal provisions of the agreement are that in implementing the South Vietnamese people's <coughs> right to self-determination, the two South Vietnamese parties will decide, will agree among each other on free elections for offices to be decided by the two parties at a time to be decided by uh, the two parties. These elections will be supervised first and organized first by an institution which has the title of National Council for National Reconciliation and Concord, whose members will be equally appointed by the two sides, which will operate on the principle of unanimity, and <coughs> which will come into being after negotiation between the two parties who are obligated by this agreement to do their utmost to bring this institution into being uh, within, within 90 days. <coughs> Leaving aside the technical jargon, the significance of this agreement, of this part of the agreement is that the United States has consistently maintained that we would not impose any <coughs> political solution on the people of South Vietnam. The United States has consistently maintained that <coughs> we would not impose a coalition government or a disguised coalition government on the people of South Vietnam. If you examine the provisions of this chapter, you will see, first, that the existing government in Saigon can remain in office. Secondly, that the political future of South Vietnam depends on agreement between the South Vietnamese parties and not on an agreement that the United States has imposed on these parties. Thirdly, that the nature of this political evolution, the timing of this political evolution, is left to the South Vietnamese party. And that the organ that is created to see to it that the elections that are organized will be conducted properly is one in which the South Vietnamese parties, each of the South Vietnamese parties, has a veto. The other significant provision of this agreement is the <coughs> requirement that the South Vietnamese parties will attempt, will bring about a reduction of their armed forces and that the forces uh, being reduced uh, will, be, will be demobilized. The next chapter deals with <coughs> the reunification of Vietnam and the relationship between North and South Vietnam. <coughs> In uh, the many negotiations that I've conducted over recent weeks, not the least arduous was the negotiation conducted with the ladies and gentlemen of the press who uh, constantly raised issues with respect to sovereignty, existence of uh, South Vietnam as a political entity, and other matters of this kind. I will return to this issue at the end when I sum up uh, the agreement. But it is obvious that there is no dispute in the agreement between the parties that there is an entity called South Vietnam and that 
the future unity of uh, Vietnam as it comes about will be decided by negotiation between North and South Vietnam. That it will not be negotiated, that it will not be achieved by military force. Indeed, that the use of military force with respect to uh, bringing about unification or any other form of coercion is impermissible <coughs> according to the terms of this agreement. Secondly, there are specific provisions in this chapter with respect to the demilitarized zone. Uh, there is a repetition of the agreement of 1954, which makes the demarcation line along the 19, uh, along the 17th parallel provisional, which means pending reunification. There's a specific provision that both North and South Vietnam shall respect the demilitarized zone on either side of the provisional military demarcation line. And there is another provision that indicates that among the subjects that can be negotiated will be modalities of civilian movement across the demarcation line, which makes it clear that military movement across the demilitarized zone is in all circumstances prohibited. Now, this may be an appropriate point to explain what our position has been with respect to the DMZ. <coughs> there has been a great deal of discussion about the issue of sovereignty and about the issue of legitimacy, which is to say which government is in control of South Vietnam. And finally, about why we laid such great stress on the issue of the demilitarized zone. <coughs> we had to place stress on the issue of the demilitarized zone because the provisions of the agreement with respect to infiltration, with respect to replacement, <coughs> with respect to any of the military provisions would have made no sense whatever if there was not some demarcation line that defined where South Vietnam began if we had accepted the proposition that would have in effect eroded the demilitarized zone then the provisions of the agreement with respect to restrictions <laughs> about the introduction of men and materiel into South Vietnam would have been unilateral restrictions applying only to the United States and only to our allies. <coughs> and therefore, if there was to be any meaning to <coughs> the separation of military and political issues, if there was to be any permanence to the military provisions that had been negotiated, then it was essential that there was a definition of where the obligations of this agreement <coughs> began. And uh, as you can see from the text of the agreement, uh, the principles that we defended were essentially achieved. Chapter 6 deals with the <coughs> international machinery and we will uh, discuss that when I, discuss, when I uh, talk about the associated protocols of, uh, of the agreement. Chapter 7 deals with Laos and Cambodia. Now, <coughs> the problem of Laos and Cambodia has two parts. One part concerns those obligations which can be undertaken by the parties signing the agreement. That is to say, the three Vietnamese parties and the United States. <coughs> those measures that they can take 
which affect the situation in Laos and Cambodia. A second part of the agreement of uh, the situation in Laos has to concern the uh, nature of the civil conflict that is taking place within Laos and Cambodia, and the solution of which, of course, must involve as well the Laotian parties, the two Laotian parties, and the innumerable Cambodian factions. Let me talk about the provisions of the agreement with respect to Laos and Cambodia and our firm expectations as to the future in Laos and Cambodia. The provisions of the agreement with respect to Laos and Cambodia <coughs> reaffirm as an obligation to all the parties, the provisions of the 1954 Agreement on Cambodia and of the 1962 Agreement on Laos, which affirm the neutrality and right to self-determination of, of, of those two countries. And they are therefore consistent with our basic position with respect also to South Vietnam. In terms of the immediate conflict, the provisions of the agreement specifically prohibit the use of Laos and Cambodia for military and any other operation against any of the signatories of the Paris Agreement or against any other country. In other words, there is a flat prohibition against the use of base areas in Laos and Cambodia. There is a flat prohibition against the use of Laos and Cambodia for infiltration into Vietnam or for that matter into any other country. Finally, there is a requirement that all foreign troops be withdrawn from Laos and Cambodia. And it is clearly understood that North Vietnamese troops are considered foreign with respect to Laos and Cambodia. Now, as to the conflict within these countries, which could not be formally settled in an agreement which is not signed by the parties of that conflict, let me make this statement without elaborating it. It is our firm expectation that within a short period of time, there will be a formal ceasefire in Laos. relevant to the execution of this agreement. Our side will take <coughs> the appropriate measures to prevent the <coughs> to uh, <coughs> will take the appropriate measures <coughs> to indicate that it will not attempt to change 
the situation by force. We have reason to believe that our position is clearly understood by all concerned parties. And I will not go beyond this in my statement. Chapter 8 deals with the relationship between the United States and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. As I have said in my briefings on October 26 and on December 16th, and as the President affirmed on many occasions, the last time in his speech last evening, the United States is seeking a peace that heals. We have had many armistices in Indochina. We want a peace that will last. <clears throat> and therefore, it is our firm intention in our relationship to the Democratic Republic of Vietnam to move from hostility to normalization and from normalization <coughs> to conciliation and cooperation. And we believe that under conditions of peace, we can contribute throughout Indochina to a realization of the humane aspirations of all the peoples of Indochina. And we will in that spirit perform our traditional role of helping people realize these aspirations in peace. Chapter 9 of the agreement is the usual implementing thing, provision. So much for the uh, for the agreement. Now let me say a word about the protocol. <coughs> there are four protocols or implementing instruments to the agreement. On the return of American prisoners, on the implementation and institution of an International Control Commission, on the regulations with respect to the ceasefire and the implementation and institution of a joint military commission among the concerned parties, and a protocol about the deactivation and re removal of mines. I have given you the relevant provisions of the protocol concerning the return of prisoners. They will be returned at, at periodic intervals in Hanoi to American authorities and not to American private groups. They will be picked up by American airplanes, except for prisoners held in the southern part of South Vietnam, which will be released at designated points in the south, again, to American authorities. <coughs> we will receive on Saturday, the day of signing of the agreement, a list of all American prisoners held throughout Indochina. And both parties, that is to say, all parties have an obligation to assist each other in obtaining information about the prisoners missing in action and about uh, the location of graves 
of American personnel throughout Indochina. <clears throat> the uh, International Commission has the right to, to visit the last place of detention of the prisoner as well as the place from which they are released. Now, to the International Control Commission. You will remember that one of the reasons for the impasse in December was the difficulty of agreeing with the North Vietnamese about the size of the International Commission, its function, or the location of its teams. On this occasion, there is no point in rehearsing all the differences. It is, however, useful to point out that at that time, the proposal of the North Vietnamese was that the International Control Commission have a membership of 250, no organic logistics or communication, dependent entirely on its authority to move on the party it was supposed to be uh, investigating and over half of its personnel was supposed to be located in Saigon, which is not the place where most of the infiltration that we were concerned with was likely to take place. Uh, we have distributed to you an outline of the basic structure of this commission. Briefly stated, there is it, its total number is 11, it's 1,160, drawn from Canada, Hungary, Indonesia, and Poland. It has a headquarters in Saigon. It has seven uh, regional teams, 26 teams based in localities throughout Vietnam, which were chosen uh, either because forces were in contact there or because we estimated that these were the areas where the violations of the ceasefire were more, most probable. There are 12 teams at border crossing points there are seven teams that are set aside for points of entry which have yet to be chosen for the... Uh, there is one team, one reinforced team located at the demilitarized zone and its responsibility extends along the entire uh, demilitarized zone. It is in fact a team and a half. It is 50% larger than a normal, uh, than a normal uh, border team. And it represents one of the many <laughs> compromises that were made between our insistence on two teams, their insistence on one team. And uh, by a brilliant stroke, we settled on a team and a half. <laughs> <laughs> At, uh, with respect to the operation of the, uh, of the International Commission, it is supposed to operate on the principle of unanimity, which is to say that its reports, if they are commission reports, have to be, uh, have to uh, have the approval of all four members. However, each member is permitted to submit its own opinion, so that as a practical matter, any member of the commission can make a finding of a violation and say, submit a report uh, in the first instance to the parties. The International Commission will report for the time being to the four parties to the agreement. We expect an international conference, an international conference will take place. We expect at the foreign minister's level, within a month of signing the agreement, that international conference 
will establish a relationship between the International Commission and itself or any other international body that is mutually agreed upon so that the International Commission is not only reporting to the parties that it is investigating. But for the time being, until the International Conference has met, there was no other practical group to which the International Commission could report. In addition to this, inter to this international group, there are two other institutions that are supposed to supervise the ceasefire. There is, first of all, an institution called the Four-Party Joint Military Commission, which is composed of ourselves and the four and the three Vietnamese parties, which is located in the same places as the International Commission, are charged with roughly uh, the same functions. But as a practical matter, uh, it is supposed to conduct the preliminary investigations. Its disagreements are automatically referred to the International Commission, and moreover, any party can request the International Commission to conduct an investigation regardless of what the four-party commission does and regardless of whether the four-party commission has completed its investigation or not. After the United States has completed its withdrawal, the four-party military commission will be transformed into a two-party commission <coughs> composed of the uh, two uh, South Vietnamese parties. Uh, the total number of supervisory personnel, therefore, will be in the neighborhood of 4,500 during the period that the four-party commission is in existence and in the neighborhood of about 3,000 after the four-party commission ceases, ceases operating and the two-party uh, uh, commission uh, goes, comes into being. And finally, there's a protocol uh, concerning the removal and deactivation of mines, which is self-explanatory and simply explains, discusses the relationship between our efforts and the efforts of the DRV uh, concerning the removal and, uh, and deactivation of mines, which is one of the uh, obligations we have undertaken in in the agreement. Now let me uh, point out one other uh, <coughs> problem. On Saturday, January 27th, the Secretary of State on behalf of the United States will sign uh, the agreement uh, bringing the ceasefire and all the other provisions of the agreement and the protocols into force. He will sign in the morning a document <coughs> involving the four parties and in the afternoon a document between us and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. And you have these documents are identical except that the preamble differs in both cases. <coughs> the reason for this somewhat convoluted uh, procedure is that while the agreement provides that the two South Vietnamese parties should settle their disputes in an atmosphere of national reconciliation and concord, I think it is safe to say that they have not yet quite reached that point. Indeed, that they have not yet been prepared to recognize each other's existence. This being the case, uh, it was necessary to devise one document <coughs> in which neither of the South Vietnamese parties was mentioned by name, and therefore no other party could be mentioned by name on the principle of equality. <coughs> so the uh, four party document document that will have four signatures uh, 
can be read with great care and you will not know until you get to the signature page whom exactly it applies to. It refers only to the parties participating in the Paris Conference, uh, which are, uh, of course, well known to the parties participating in the Paris Conference. <laughs> uh, it will be signed on two separate pages, uh, the United States and the, uh, the uh, GVN is signing on one page, and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam and its ally is signing on a separate page. And this procedure has aged us all by several years. <laughs> then there is another document which will be signed by the Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam in the afternoon. That document in its operative provisions is word for word the same as the document which will be signed in the morning and which contains the obligations to which the South of Two South Vietnamese parties are obligated. It differs from that document only in the preamble and in its concluding paragraph. And in the preamble it says the United States with the concurrence of the government of uh, the Republic of Vietnam and the DRV with the concurrence of the provisional revolutionary government and the rest is the same. And then the concluding uh, paragraph has the same uh, adaptation. That document, of course, is not signed by either Saigon or its, uh, or its opponent, and therefore their obligations are derived from the four-party document. Now, I, I don't want to take any time in going into the abstruse legalisms. I simply wanted to explain to you why there were two different signature ceremonies and why, when we handed out the text of the agreement, we appended to the document which contains the legal obligations which apply to everybody, namely the four parties, why we appended another section that contained a different preamble and a different, op and a different implementing paragraph which is going to be signed by the Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Uh, and <coughs> this will be true with respect to the agreement and three of the protocols. The fourth protocol regarding the removal of mines applies only to the United States and the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, and therefore we are in the happy position of having to sign only one document. Now then, let me uh, summarize for you how we got to this point and some of the uh, <coughs> aspects of the agreement that we consider significant and then I will answer your questions. <coughs> As you know, when I met with this group on December 16th, we <coughs> had to report that the negotiations in Paris uh, seem to have reached a stalemate. We had not agreed at that time, though we didn't say so, on the, we could not find a formula to take into account the conflicting views with respect to signing. There were disagreements with respect to the DMZ and with the associated aspects of, uh, of what identity South Vietnam was to have in the agreement. There was a total deadlock with respect to the protocols, uh, which I summed up in the uh, December 16th uh, press conference. The North Vietnamese approach to international control and ours were so totally at variance that it seemed impossible at that point to 
come to any satisfactory uh, conclusion. And there began to be even some concern that the separation which we thought we had achieved in October between the release of our prisoners and the question of civilian prisoners in South Vietnam was breaking down. <coughs> when we reassem reassembled on January 8th, we did not do so in the most cordial atmosphere that I remember. <coughs> However, by the morning of January 9th, it became apparent that both sides were determined to make a serious effort to break the deadlock in negotiations. And we adopted a mode of procedure by which issues in the agreement and issues of principle with respect to the protocols were discussed at meetings between Special Advisor Lee Duck To and myself, while concurrently an American team headed by Ambassador Sullivan and a Vietnamese team headed by Vice Minister Tuck would work on the implementation of the principles as they apply to the protocols. For example, the Special Advisor and I might agree on the principle of border control posts and their number. But then the problem of how to locate them, according to what criteria and with what mode of operation, presented enormous difficulties. And let me on this occasion also point out that these negotiations required the closest cooperation throughout our government between the White House and the State Department, between all the elements of our team, and that therefore the usual speculation of who did what to whom is really extraordinarily uh, misplaced without a cooperative effort by everybody. We could not have achieved what we have presented last night and this morning. The uh, Special Advisor and I then spent the week first on uh, working out the unresolved issues in the agreement and then the uh, <coughs> unresolved issues with respect to the protocols. And finally, the surrounding circumstances of schedules and, uh, and procedures. <coughs> Ambassador Sullivan remained behind to draft the implementing provisions of the agreements that had been achieved during the week. The Special Advisor and I remained in close uh, contact so by the time we met again yesterday, the issues that remained were very few indeed, were settled relatively rapidly. And, and I may on this occasion also point out that while the North Vietnamese are the most difficult people to negotiate with that I have ever encountered, when they do not want to settle, they are also the most effective that I have dealt with when they finally decide to settle, so that we have gone through uh, through peaks and valleys in these uh, in these negotiations of extraordinary intensity. Now then, let me uh, sum up where this agreement has left us. First with respect to what we said we would try to achieve, then with respect to some of its significance, and finally with respect to the future. First, when I met this group 
on October 26 and delivered myself of some epigrammatic phrases. <coughs> the, uh, uh, we <coughs> obviously did not want to give a complete checklist and we did not want to release the agreement as it then stood because it did not seem to us desirable to provide a checklist against which both sides would then have to measure success and failure in terms of their prestige. At that time, too, we did not say that it had always been foreseen that there would be another three or four days of negotiation after this tentative agreement had been reached. And the reason why we asked for another <coughs> negotiation was because it seemed to us at that point that for a variety of reasons, which I explained then and again on December 16th, those issues could not be settled within the time frame that the North Vietnamese expected. It is now a matter of history and it is therefore not essential to go into a debate of on what we based this judgment. But that was the reason why the agreement was not signed on October 31st and not any of the speculations that have been so much in print and on television. Now, what did we say on October 26 we wanted to achieve? We said, first of all, that we wanted to make sure that the control machinery would be in place at the time of ceasefire. We did this because we had information that there were plans by the other side to mount a major offensive to coincide with the signing of the ceasefire agreement. This objective has been achieved by the fact that the uh, protocols will be signed on the same day as the agreement, by the fact that the International Control Commission and the Four-Party Military Commission will meet within 24 hours of the agreement going into effect or no later than Monday morning Saigon time, that the regional teams of the International Control Commission will be in place 48 hours thereafter, and that all other teams will be in place within 15 and a maximum to 30 days after that. Second, we said that we wanted to compress the time interval between the ceasefires we expected in Laos and Cambodia and the ceasefire in Vietnam. For reasons which I have explained to you, we cannot be as specific about the ceasefires in Laos and Cambodia as we can about the agreements that are being signed on Saturday. But we can say with confidence that the, cease for, that the formal ceasefire in Laos will go into effect in a considerably shorter period of time than was envisaged in uh, October. And since the ceasefire in Cambodia depends to some extent on developments in Laos, we expect the same to be true there. We said that certain <coughs> linguistic ambiguities uh, should be removed. <coughs> the linguistic ambiguities were produced by the somewhat extraordinary negotiating procedure whereby a change in the English text did not always produce a correlative change in the Vietnamese text. 
All the linguistic ambiguities to which we referred in October have in fact been removed. At that time, I mentioned only one, and therefore I'm free to recall it. I pointed out that the United States position had consistently been a rejection of the imposition of a coalition government on the people of South Vietnam. We, I said then, that the National Council of Reconciliation was not a coalition government, nor was it conceived as a coalition government. The Vietnamese language text, however, permitted an interpretation of the word administrative structure as applied to the National Council of Reconciliation, which would have lent itself to the interpretation that it came close or was identical with a coalition. that we had to find a procedure for signing which would be acceptable to all the parties for whom obligations uh, were involved. Uh, this has been uh, achieved. I pointed out on October 26 <coughs> that we would seek greater precision with respect to certain obligations particularly without spelling them out as they applied to the demilitarized zone and to the obligations with respect to Laos and Cambodia. That too has been achieved. And I pointed out in <coughs> December that we were looking for some means, which some expression which would make clear that the two parts of Vietnam would live in peace with each other and that neither side would impose its solution on the other by force. This is now explicitly provided and we have achieved formulation in which, in a number of the paragraphs, such as Article 14, 18E, and 20, there are specific references to the sovereignty of South Vietnam. There are specific references, moreover, to the same thing in Article 6 and Article 11 of the ICCS mm -hmm. Protocol. There are specific references to the right of the South Vietnamese people to self-determination. And therefore, we believe that we have achieved the substantial changes that we mentioned on October, or, or adaptations that we asked for on October 26. We did not increase our demands after October 26, and we substantially achieved the clarifications which we sought. Now then, it is obvious that a war that has lasted for 10 years will have many elements that cannot be completely satisfactory to all the parties concerned. And in the two periods where the North Vietnamese we're working with dedication and seriousness on a conclusion. The period in October and the period after we resumed talks in January 8th. It was always clear that a lasting peace could come about only if neither side sought to achieve everything that it had wanted. Indeed, that stability depended on the relative satisfaction and therefore on the relative dissatisfaction of all of the parties concerned. 
and therefore it is also clear that when whether this agreement brings a lasting peace or not depends not only on its provisions but also on the spirit in which it is implemented. It will be our challenge in the future to move the controversies that could not be stilled by any one document from the level of military conflict to the level of positive human aspirations and to absorb the enormous talents and dedication of the people of Indochina in tasks of construction rather than in tasks of destruction. We will make a major effort to move to create a framework where we hope in a short time the animosities and the hatred and the suffering of this period will be seen as aspects of a past and where the debates concern differences of opinion as to how to achieve positive goals. Of course the hatreds will not rapidly disappear and of course people who have fought for 25 years will not easily give up their objectives but also people who have suffered for 25 years. May at last come to know that they can achieve their real satisfaction by other and less brutal means. The President said yesterday that we have to remain vigilant and so we shall. But we shall also dedicate ourselves to positive efforts. And as for us at home, <coughs> it should be clear by now that no one in this war has had a monopoly of anguish and that no one in these debates has had a monopoly on moral insight. And now that at last we have achieved an agreement in which the United States <coughs> did not prescribe the political future to its allies. An agreement which should preserve the dignity and the self-respect of all of the parties that together with healing the wounds in Indochina, we can begin to heal the wounds in America.